turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You know, I have really enjoyed the preaching this morning, and I, I can't hear preaching like that, but what I think. This is why there is an ambassador of Baptist College. That's the kind of preaching that I cut my teeth on when I was only a sophomore in high school. An old man traipsed across that platform and he put some fire in my bones that has never gone out. And I'll tell you what, you don't get that by hearing a Calvinist preach. You get it because men are passionate about their preaching in the Word of God. I had Dr. Wayne Van Gelderen tell me years ago, when I was just uh, in my early 30s, he said, Brother Comfort, if you ever lose your passion, you lose your power. And uh, it thrills my heart when I go out and I see our graduates that are saturated in Bible and they're passionate about it. All right, let's stand please for the reading of God's Word. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, there was a time when I would uh, do as much running as Greg Much did. But uh, when he gets my age, he may have bad knees. And uh, uh, Bruce Love, there was a time that you could run a little bit, but uh, he's had knee replacement. How's it coming? My son-in-law, Mike Pelletier, is insistent that I have a knee replacement. And I say, Mike, when you have a brain replacement, I'll have a knee replacement. All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning with verse 13. Paul says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we send you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, Comfort one another with these words. Thank you very much. You may be seated. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is the first real clear passage in the entire Bible on what is called the rapture. As a matter of fact, Dr. H.J. Ironside said, you can go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and you will only find one reference that deals with the rapture. That's John chapter 14 and verse 3. Jesus said, and if I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So uh, I believe that there is another passage in the gospel and all due respect to H. Ironside, that deals with the rapture. And that is John 11, 25 and 26. Jesus saith unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. You say, now wait a minute. Are you telling me that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are only two passages that deal with the second coming? I didn't say that. I said there are only two passages that deal with the rapture. Now, there are people that have been saved for years and are not aware of this simple truth, that the second coming of Christ is in two phases. When he comes for those of us who are saved, his feet will not touch the earth, but we will be raised to meet him in the air. That's called the rapture. Somebody says, now wait a minute. Where do you find that word rapture in your English Bible? You don't find it. It is what is called a transliteration. 
And that's simply a fancy word for saying that we take a foreign word and we make it an English word. And it comes from the Latin word rapto, rapture, caught up together with them in the clouds. After the rapture, there will be seven years of tribulation when all hell breaks loose on earth. After the seven-year tribulation, Jesus is coming back to earth. Those of us who are saved are coming back to earth with Him. That is called the revelation. So there is the rapture, seven years of tribulation. Then when He comes back to earth, that is called the revelation. Now as far as I can tell, there are only two passages in the Bible that mention both phases of the second coming in the same verse. For instance, 2 Timothy 4 in verse 1, I charge thee therefore before the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing, that's the rapture, and at his kingdom, that's the revelation. Again, Titus 2 in verse 13, looking for that blessed hope, that's the rapture, and the glorious appearing, that's the revelation of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now obviously, what we are concerned with tonight is the rapture. And from our text, I want you to notice several things about the rapture. Number one, notice please verse 16. It is a sure event. Verse 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. It is a sure event. 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 5, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come. Philippians 3 and verse 20, For our citizenship is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 8, Henceforth there is a crown of righteousness laid up for me which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. It is a sure event. Years ago I was in Okinawa. And the pastor came to one of his military men who was a computer expert. And he said, do you know that the very day they hung Jesus on Calvary, there were no less than 33 Old Testament prophecies fulfilled. He said, would you do me a favor? Would you feed into the computer and tell me what the chances are that 33 prophecies could be fulfilled in one man in one day? You know what the computer read out? The chances that 33 prophecies could be fulfilled in one man in one day were less than one in 87, comma, with 93 zeros after it. Think of that. But do you know that in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Christ, there were over 300 Old Testament prophecies fulfilled? But get this. For every one promise on the first coming of Christ in the Bible, you will find 20 promises on the second coming of Christ. In the New Testament, there are 7,000. Then 330 verses in the New Testament alone speak of the second coming of Christ. Do you know that there is more in the Bible about King Jesus than there is about baby Jesus? There is more in the Bible about Jesus on a throne than even Jesus on a cross. He's coming the second time. Several years ago, I read in the newspaper where a group of scholars had deduced that Jesus really did not teach he was coming the second time. Now, Brother Dylan, there's a Hebrew word I hope you've taught your students. Baloney. Baloney. Now, I'm going to let you be the judge. Do you know that every chapter in First and Second Thessalonians speaks of the second coming of Christ? 
Would you follow me please? Every single chapter. 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he had raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 19. For what is her hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ and his coming? 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 13. To the end that he may establish your hearts, unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of the Lord Jesus with all his saints. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 9 and 10. Uh, verses 7 and 8. Notice please 2 Thessalonians 1 verses 7 and 8. And to your trouble rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance upon all them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 1 and 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Second Thessalonians 3 and verse 5. And the Lord directs your heart into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. There it is, young people. And any preacher that denies the second coming has to rip those two books right out of his Bible. I had a lady in Pittsburgh come to me years ago, and she said, Brother Comfort, I went to my Presbyterian preacher, and I asked him if he believed in the second coming. She said he told me he didn't believe it, but it didn't matter whether you believed it or not. What do you think about that? I wish that woman would have had enough courage to say, Now, wait a minute, preacher. It's not important whose seminary you've been to, but it is important whether or not you believe in the second coming of Christ. She said, Brother Comfort, I've been in that church ever since I was knee high. She said, I can't leave that church now. I said, God pity a person who loves his denomination more than he loves the Bible. Now most of you know I was not reared in an independent Baptist home. I was reared in a Roman Catholic home. But at the age of 15, I was born again. I became an independent Baptist by my study of the Bible. But I will tell you this, I love my Bible a whole lot more than I love the tag independent Baptist. And if the time ever comes when independent Baptists are known for their denial of the second coming, I'm going to call myself by another name. I am not married to a denominational tag. Now, maybe we've got somebody visiting here tonight that you go to a church where you've never heard your preacher preach on the second coming. You say, well, I don't know whether or not he believes it. Well, if he's never said, he doesn't believe it. And if he doesn't believe in the second coming, he doesn't believe in the verbal inspiration of the Word of God either. Mark it down. If he doesn't believe in the second coming, he probably doesn't believe in the virgin birth either. So if you go to that kind of church, get out of that church and get in a church where they believe and preach the second coming. Number one, it is a sure event. Now go back please to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 16. Number two, it is a sudden event. Verse 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. You know what that Greek word means? A military command. What's that military command going to be? You remember his command to Noah was come in. His command to Lot was come out. His command to you and to me who are saved is going to be 
come up. Revelation 4 and verse 1. And the first voice which I heard was as a royal trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. One day Jesus is coming in the air. He's shouting, Come up hither. And I'm. Corinthians 15 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkle of an eye, at the last trump. And ladies and gentlemen, it's going to happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Somebody said, that's as quickly as you can bat your eye. No, my friend, it's a whole lot quicker than that. Now let me call something your attention. The word twinkling is the same word from which we get the word atom, A-T-O-M. An atom is the smallest unit of matter. The twinkling is the smallest unit of time. It is not the blinking of the eye. It is the sparkling of the eye. It is less than one one one-thousandth of a second. Can you imagine that? In less than one one one-thousandth of a second, I am changed from a body of mortality into a body of immortality. I am changed from a body sown in corruption to a body raised in incorruption in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. Science tells us today that the light from the farthest star has probably never reached the earth. They estimate that the light from the farthest star is about 500 million light years away. What does that mean? You are aware that light travels at the rate of 186,000 miles per second. Not per minute, but per second. And get it, it would take 500 million years going at the rate of 186,000 miles per second from the light from the farthest star to ever reach the earth. Question, where's heaven? Heaven's beyond the farthest star. Where's Jesus? Jesus is in heaven. It's not going to take Jesus 500 million light years to come back and get his little children. He's coming in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. Now, when Jesus was on earth, he told his disciples he was coming again. He never told them when, but do you know that he intimated he may come in their lifetime? Did you know that? For instance, 1 John 2, 28, And now little children abide in Him, that when He may appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. So John was expecting Him to come. Paul said in Philippians 3 and verse 20, For our citizenship is in heaven, for months also we look for the Savior the Lord Jesus Christ. Jude said in Jude verse 14, And Enoch also the seven from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh within thousands of his saints. James said in James 5, 8, and 9, Be ye therefore patient, establish your heart, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh, the judge standeth before the door. Peter said in 1 Peter 5 and verse 4, But when the chief shepherd shall appear, then shall ye receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. I want to ask you tonight, are you looking for his soon return? I was preaching along this line years ago, and an elderly lady came to me. You can tell this was years ago by the illustration. She came to me and she said, Now, Brother Comfort, you're a young man. Well, I will admit she had a measure of discernment. She said, you're a young man. She said, I'm an old lady. She said, Jesus may come in your lifetime. But she said, I don't believe he's coming in my lifetime. You know what the Bible calls that? Three letters. S-I-N. And the reason some of you watched the kind of television you watched over spring break is because you're not expecting Jesus to come in your lifetime. If you are, it'll produce two attitudes in your life. Number one, it will produce the inward look 
of preparation. Now, let me teach you a principle about prophecy in the Bible. Prophecy is not in the Bible to entertain us. But whenever you have a prophetic statement in the Bible, it is generally accompanied by a practical application. Somebody has made this statement. Every admonition in the Bible has its root cause in the second coming. Now, what does that mean? In other words, God says, do this, why? Because Jesus is coming soon. Do this, why? Because Jesus is coming soon. All right, let me prove that to you. Take your Bible and turn, please, to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Whenever you have a prophetic statement, it's generally accompanied by a practical application. All right, notice 1 John 3, verses 2 and 3. It says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All right, that's a prophetic statement, right? All right, verse 3, here's a practical application. Every man that hath this hope in him, what? Purifieth himself, even as he also is pure. Hey, if you're looking for the second coming, no preacher's going to have to browbeat you into giving up dirty habits. You'll give them up because you won't want to be ashamed when he comes again. If you're looking for the second... You'll do it because you don't want to be ashamed when he comes again. Again, Titus 2, 11 through 13. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. Don't be talking, young girls. Please don't be talking. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Why? Because we're looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. All right, young people, why should we deny ungodliness and worldly lust? Because Jesus Christ is coming soon. Excuse me, I don't have time to argue with a person who tells me he's saved and he says, is it wrong to support Hollywood? I say, get a brain. Get a brain. You mean I ought to support an industry that wants to close down Ambassador Baptist College? Not on your life. You mean I ought to support an industry that wants to padlock every fundamental Baptist church in this country? Not on your life. Hollywood doesn't have one thing I want, nor do I need. It is the most un-American, un-Christian institution that has ever been born in this country. I was preaching in Wilmington, North Carolina. A young man who was a senior in the Christian school came to me. And he said, Brother Comfort, he said, my parents, I believe, are saved. He said, I don't have any problem with that. But he said, they want to work 12, 14 hours a day, and they want to get me all these things. He said, I don't want things. He said, I want parents. He said, do you know we have HBO Hell's Box Office coming into our living room? He said, many nights I have lain on my bed at night and watched nudity on the screen in my bedroom. Here's what USA Today said. 65% of young people, eight years old and older, have a television set in their bedroom. 65%. It said that 61% of those that have a television have no restrictions by their parents. God help us. God help us. And there are a whole lot of parents who are not aware what their kids are doing on that phone and on that computer. He said, Brother Comfort, I went to my daddy's dresser drawer and I took his 357 Magnum. And he said, I put the barrel to my head. He said, I spun the barrel and I said, Now God, if you want to take my life, may the bullet stop uh, the barrel stop where the bullet is. He said, four times I squeezed the trigger and nothing happened. I want to say in no way were those parents looking for the second coming to have garbage in their living room. Hey, this is unusual. 
A preacher in Alabama told me this. He said, Brother Comfort, we had to expel a kindergarten student for immorality. He said, I've never heard of that in all my ministry. He said, let me tell you what I did. He said, I called the parents in, and they claimed to be Christians. And I said, listen, this is unusual. We're having something that I've never heard of before in my entire ministry, expelling a kindergarten kid for immorality. He said, is there anything in your home that could cause this young man to act as he's acted? You know what they said? They said, Pastor, we do have the Playboy Network coming in our living room. God help us. God help us. Do you need to do some spiritual house cleaning? If Jesus came tonight, would you be ashamed to meet him? The inward look of preparation, number two. It will produce the outward look of occupation. Romans 13, 11, and 12. And that knowing the time, it's high time to wake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 6. Let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. People often come to me and they say, Brother Comfort, will you chronicle your ministry through the years? And here's the way I chronicle it. In the 60s and 70s and halfway through the 80s, Brother Brubaker knows this, there were times when we would have to put chairs in the aisles on a Monday night. Many times we would keep the, uh, the choir up until we let the children be dismissed to go to the children's meetings. No place for the choir in the congregation. And in those days, we had an average of 30 professions a meeting. Many times we would have 100 professions in a meeting. I never will forget the last service that I preached at Southside Baptist Church in Greenville, I told the folks, let's make that lost folks night. I said, now here's what I want you to do. I want you to commit to God that I'm going to do my best to bring an unsaved person on a Sunday night, the last night of the meeting. We had about 2,000 people there. That night I preached and gave the invitation. I just started it and they started flocking down the aisle. Somebody came to get saved. They got me. I dealt with them for a half. down the aisle to get saved. If I preached in a Christian school in those days to 150 kids, 25 or 30 would come down the aisle to get saved. I preached in Newington, Connecticut in the Christian school. Dennis Matney, who had surrendered under our ministry, was the headmaster. 47 young people came down the aisle to surrender for full-time Christian service. Dennis Matney got up before his kids. He said, kids, five years ago in a Ron Comfort meeting, I did the same thing you're doing today. He said, if I spent all my life as a headmaster of a public school, I'd never see 47 young people surrender. And that was a, not an unusual thing in those days. But we got to the mid-80s. And you know what I found? Parents no longer wanted their kids to have a ministry. They wanted them to enjoy the American dream, and they wanted them to have a career. Now let me bear my heart with you tonight. In my 78 years of my life, I have never been more burdened than I am tonight. Everywhere I go, it's the same scenario. The harvest is plenteous. The labors are few. The labors are few. Hey, I went to Bob Jones Academy as a sophomore in high school. 1953, 1954. Do you know in those days there were 1,200 preacher boys at Bob Jones University? Do you know that in the 60s, Tennessee Temple and Bob Jones had combined 2,000 preacher boys? Today there's no such thing as a Tennessee Temple. I was president of preacher boys in 1960. There were 1,000 preacher boys. You know how many there are today? Less than 250. Now, wait a minute. I'm not throwing stones at any college. 
We've got 25 less preacher boys now than we did 10 years ago. Why? Why? I preached at Maranatha Baptist Bible College, and Brother Spencer heard this time and time again. Dr. Cedarholm would get up and say, 95% of our graduates are in full-time Christian service. 95% of our graduates. I preached there five years ago when Chuck Phelps was the president. After chapel, I said, Chuck, how many students do you have? He said, between eight and 900. About twice as many as they had when Dr. Cedarholm was there. I said, how many of those young people are training for ministry? He said, less than 14%. Where are the labors coming from, ladies and gentlemen? Rich Tozier, my good friend, traveled with me this summer. He went back to his alma mater, to Troy Shoemaker, who's the president, a good man, a good man. And he said, Troy, when you and I were students, there were 600 preacher boys on campus. He said the preacher boys were the leaders on campus. He said, is that true today? Troy said, I wish I could say it was. Our student body is twice as big as it was in those days, and we have about 200 preacher boys. My heart is so burdened about that. I want to challenge you when you get to be a parent. You pray that God will put your children in full-time Christian service. You say, now, wait a minute, I'm not going to push my children into full-time Christian service. No, but you're doing what God said to do. Pray the Lord of the harvest that he'd send forth labors. I stood at the pinnacle of the temple seven years ago, the last year I was president. And as I looked across the Kidron Valley, there was the largest Jewish cemetery in the world, the Mount of Olives. Whenever Jesus said, white at sepulchers full of dead men's bones, here's what he meant. A patriarch would die. They'd cut a hole in the ground. They'd put his bones in that hole. His children would die. They'd put their bones in that hole. The grandchildren would die. They'd put their bones in that hole. And in many of those graves, there are several generations of bones in one grave. And as I stood there, God began to deal with my heart. You know what he impressed upon me? Ron Comfort, one day you're only going to be a statistic. That's all you're going to be. Let me tell you some folks. Two weeks after you and I are put in the ground, nobody's going to miss us but our immediate family. That's it. And as I stood there, God began to deal with me. And he said, Ron Comfort, the only thing that's important about your life is what you leave spiritually to the next generation. Maybe there's a young person in here tonight. You've come for the one-year Bible because your parents have insisted that you do that. But I want to say it's a tragedy to get this training and to see the fields are white and the harvest, but the labors are few. All right, number one, it's a sure event. Number two, it's a sudden event. Number three, it is a separating event. Notice the latter part of verse 16. It says the dead in Christ shall rise first. Verse 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. There's a qualifying phrase in that passage, two words, those who are in Christ. Are you in Christ tonight? First seven years of my life, I was in a Roman Catholic church, wasn't in Christ. The next eight years of my life, I was in a Southern Baptist church, but I was not in Christ. Young people, do you know that I travel the state of North Carolina singing? But if Jesus had come, I would have been left behind. I was not in Christ. Are you in Christ? All right, let me ask you a question. How many of you have read or you have seen the videos left behind, would you raise your hand, please? All right, the vast majority has. And they're good in many aspects. I sat by a man on the airplane who was reading a left behind book. He was an unsaved person. It gave me a tremendous opportunity to witness to him. So it's good in many aspects. But there is a grave doctrinal error about which you need to be aware. Take your Bible and turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, please. 
Now, here's the most often asked question to me about prophecy. Brother Comfort, will there be any saved in the tribulation period? What do you think? Will there be any saved in the tribulation? All right, look this way. The video that I saw, the pilot is unsaved. His wife is saved. She tries to get him saved. He wants nothing to do with it. In the course of trying to get him saved, she tells him about the rapture, that one day Jesus is coming in the air. Those who are saved are going to be raised to meet him in the air. Those who are not will be left behind to go through seven years of tribulation. Well, the pilot is having an affair with a stewardess on an airplane. One day he's on a flight and he's listening to his radio system. And one calamity after another is announced over his radio system. By the way, have you ever thought about the 24-hour news cycle during the tribulation? One breaking news after another. Well, finally, as he's listening, stewardess comes to the cockpit. She said, sir, many of the passengers are gone. We don't know where they've gone. We've checked the bathrooms. They're not in there. The doors of the plane have not been open. So he keeps listening to his radio system. And all of a sudden, he says, I better call home to see if my wife and family are all right. He calls home continuously. No answer. No answer. No answer. Finally, he keeps listening, and he puts it all together. That's what my wife warned me about. The rapture has taken place. The tribulation is now, and I'm in it. So when he puts it all together, he gets saved. His unsaved daughter puts it all together, and she gets saved. An evangelical preacher who is left behind puts it together, and he gets saved. Are you listening? It ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. All right, let's read the Scripture, then I'll try to interpret it. Notice, please, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. Even him, Antichrist, whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Get it. Verse 11. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. All right, look this way. Let me try to answer the question, will there be any saved in the tribulation? Please don't misunderstand. Millions upon millions will be saved in the tribulation period. According to Ezekiel chapter 38 and chapter 39, Russia is going to march down to Jerusalem on a horseback. In that northern invasion, Zechariah 13, 8 and 9, two-thirds of Israel is wiped out leaving one-third. That one-third that is left, Romans 11, 26, and 27, all Israel is saved. According to Zechariah 12, 10, they'll look upon him whom they appear, claim him as their Messiah, and the nation of Israel will be born again as in a day. All right, now listen. Through Israel's conversion, Revelation 7, 9 through 17, there will be 144,000 Jews, not Jehovah's Witnesses, but Jews that will take the gospel of the kingdom and through their preaching a multitude of Gentiles which no man could number will be saved. So the answer to the question is millions upon millions will be saved. Are you listening? It won't be anybody in this auditorium tonight. Why? Verse 10, because you've received not the love of the truth that you might be saved, verse 11, and for this cause God will send you strong delusion that you should believe a lie. Here's the bottom line. If Jesus comes while this service is going on, those of us who are saved are going, but your day of grace is over if you've been left behind. 
All right, in closing, go back please to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Number one, it's a sure event. Number two, it's a sudden event. Number three, it's a separating event. And finally, number four, praise God, it's a sublime event. Verse 17, it says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Look this way, please. Hey, here's an interesting thing. There are two Greek words for the word air. One can stand on Mount Olympus in Greece, and he can... He can stand on that same mountain, and he can point downward. And the Greeks have a word for air, which means below the mountaintops. Hey, do you know what the word for air is in verse 17? Jesus is not coming in the air above the mountaintops. He's coming in the air below the mountaintops. You say, why is that important? Ephesians 2 and verse 2 says, the devil is the prince of the power of the air. You know what air he's the prince of the power of? Below the mountaintops. So get it. King Jesus is going to invade Satan's domain. He's going to snatch away his little children. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. It's going to mean three things in closing. Number one, the reunion with our loved ones. Many years ago when my wife and I lived in West Virginia, she was expecting a baby that she had carried for over ten months. We were very apprehensive. She had previously had two miscarriages. And I was fearful that this baby was going to be born deformed. So I canceled my meeting to stay home in case the baby were born deformed. I stayed home all week. The baby was not born. So I had had a meeting scheduled four years before that north of Grand Rapids, Michigan. I knew I had to honor that commitment. So I started the meeting on Sunday morning. My mother-in-law called me after the service Sunday night. She said, Ron, Joyce is going to have the baby. The top of the baby's head has not been formed. She said, Joyce doesn't know it, but the doctor said the baby cannot possibly live. So she said, I think it would be good if you got here before the baby was born to comfort Joyce at that time of heartache. So I got in my car, drove all night long to Clarksburg, West Virginia. I got there at 6 o'clock in the morning. Rachel Jan was born at 3 o'clock in the morning. Rachel Jan lived 10 minutes. And God in His wisdom and in His grace saw fit to reach down and pluck our little jewel in an ornament heaven with Rachel Jan. My wife carried Rachel Jan 10 and a half months. Never got to see her. Never got to touch her. Never got to hold her. As I stood by the grave of my little baby, my pastor read 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58. And Brother Spencer, it never meant as much to me as it did that day. As I stood there by the grave of my little baby, I said in my heart, Rachel, honey, I've never seen you before, but I love you. And on the way up, when Jesus comes, I'm going to tell you that I love you. Hey, you know, I used to look forward to going to a meeting and after the service, going back to our trailer, and our three daughters would put on their bedclothes, and they'd say, Daddy, it's love time. And so they'd jump on me and hug me and kiss me, and they'd say, Daddy, I love you, and I'd reciprocate, and I'd say, I love you, sweetheart. Uh, you know, I wish you could have heard our trailer before the girls went to sleep at night. Sounded like the Waltons. Rhonda would start it out, and she'd say, Daddy, I love you. Mommy, I love you. Good night, everybody. And then Becky would say, Daddy, I love you. Mommy, I love you. Good night, everybody. And then Robin would say, Daddy, I love you. Mommy, I love you. Good night, everybody. And then sometimes they'd say, let's do it over again. So they'd do it over again, one by one. Daddy, I love you. Mommy, I love you. Good night, everybody. And then when they finished twice, sometimes they'd say, all right, all together on three. One, two, three. Daddy, I love you. Mommy, I love you. Good night, everybody. And you know, Brother Johnson, I was never tempted to say, 
would you shut up and go to sleep? Oh, I loved it. I used to look forward to after a service was over and our three-year-old waddler, Robin, would waddle out of the nursery. I'd be talking to somebody at the front and out of the corner of my eye, I'd see that little waddler waddling down the aisle. And I knew what she would do. She'd come up to me and wrap her arms around my knees. Now I have to wrap my arms around her knees. <laughs> and she'd look up and say, Daddy, I whoop, ooh. And when she'd say that, I'd tingle all over. You know, folks, every time I was home from meetings when we li lived in Clarksburg, I would go by that cemetery. The cemetery was located where our bank was. And I never went by that cemetery but what I said in my heart, Rachel, honey, it's not going to be too long now. The reunion with our loved ones. Number two, the redemption of our bodies. Philippians 3 and verse 21, who shall also change our vile bodies that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. 1 Corinthians 15, 49, as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Romans 8 and verse 23, and we ourselves grown within ourselves waiting for the adoption to it, the redemption of our bodies. Brother Matt, I remember the two boys that were here several years for Camp Barnabas. One boy was a Filipino boy. He didn't have any arms. You know how he ate? He would go to the dining hall and he would put his fork between his big toe and his next toe and that's the way he would eat. And then there was a boy that fell out of a, a, a tree and he's paralyzed all the way down. And I'd come in every night and I'd see those boys and I never looked at those boys but what I said in my heart, one day they're going to have a new body. Listen, when we step on celestial soil and we breathe heavenly air, all of a sudden we're going to realize, hey, I'm living in a body that is totally incapable of experiencing any type of pain. Number one, the reunion with our loved ones. Number two, the redemption of our bodies. And finally, number three, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. How? For we shall see him as he is. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Years ago, I sat on the platform of a church in Indiana. Pastor got up before I was to preach and he said, Now, folks, Brother Comfort's going to preach to us in 10 minutes, but before he comes, I want us to have 10 minutes of testimonies why you're looking forward to going to heaven. I remember as though it were last night. The first person to stand was a big, husky, burly man. And he said, Ladies and gentlemen, I've got a praying mother that's home in heaven tonight. She prayed for years for me to be saved. She died and went to glory before I got saved. He said to me, the most wonderful thing about heaven is going to be my mother's there. And I'm going to run down the street of gold. I'm going to wrap my arms around my mother's neck. And I'm going to say, thank you, mother. Thank you, mother, for praying for me. He sat down. A lady stood up and she said, Pastor, you remember we stood by the grave of my little baby? And I, she said, nobody in this building tonight knows the vacuum in my life unless you've experienced it since God took my little baby. She said to me, the most wonderful thing about heaven is going to be reconciliation with my baby again. She sat down. A man stood up and he said, Pastor, every Wednesday night I ask prayer for my prodigal son. And only God knows the amount of midnight hours I've wept until there are no more tears to weep. Said, I'm looking forward to going to heaven because there'll be no prodigal sons over there. There'll be no heartache over there. But young people, listen. As I sat on the platform, I sat there with a heavy heart. You know why? In 10 minutes, nobody got up and said, I want to go to heaven because I want to see Jesus Christ. Hey, I don't care about the street of gold. I don't care about the fine mansions. I want to go to heaven 
because I want to see Jesus Christ. Fanny Crosby, the greatest songwriter perhaps the church has ever had, was blind at the age of six months, never liked to be reminded of her blindness. One day when she was well in her 90s, the El Moody was talking to her. And he said, Miss Crosby, if you had one desire of your life fulfilled, before you breathed your last breath, what would it be? He said as he stood there, he thought, she's going to say, I'd like to see a ray of sunshine. I'd like to see a dewdrop fall from a rose petal. But she didn't say that. You know what she said? She said, Mr. Moody, if I had one desire of my life fulfilled before I breathed my last breath, it would be this, that I would remain blind until I died. So the first person to gladden my eyes would be the Son of God himself. No wonder the songwriter could write, I want to see my Savior first of all, before on any others I would call. And then for countless days, on His dear face I'll gaze. I want to see my Savior first of all. When my life's work is ended and I cross the swelling tide, and the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side and his smile will be the first to welcome me I shall know him I shall know him as redeemed by his side I shall stand I shall know him I shall know him by the prince of the nails in his hands. You know who wrote that song? Fanny Crosby. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, no one's looking around. As the instrumentalists come tonight and play, have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Let me ask you this. If Jesus came right now, can you give me a Bible reason why you know you'd go to see him? Now, wait a minute. I'm not asking you, your parents are saved or your dad's a preacher or your mom's a Sunday school teacher or you're a student at Ambassador. I'm not asking any of those things. But has there been a time and a place in your life when you realize you were a poor, hell-deserving sinner you realize you could not get to heaven by your good works. You receive Christ. And if he came right now, you can give me a Bible reason why you know you'd go to meet him. If you can do that kindly, slip up your hand, please, right now. Keep him up just a moment. Keep him up just a moment. Thank you. You may put them down. Is there one anywhere in the building that say, Brother Comfort, if Jesus came tonight, I don't know that I'd go to meet him. But I'd like to know it. I'm not sure I'm saved. But I'd like to make sure tonight. Would you include me in the prayer tonight? On March the 21st, 2017. I'd like to make sure that I'm saved. If you do that kindly, slip up your hand please right now. And I will see your hand and remember you in prayer. Anywhere in the building you'd say, Preacher, pray for me. I'm not sure I'm saved. I want to make sure. Include me in the prayer. Anywhere. All right, Christian. Has God spoken to your heart tonight? You'd say, Brother Comfort, if Jesus came, I'd go to meet him. But I'd be ashamed. I'm not living as I ought to be living. I'm saved. But I'd be ashamed if Jesus came tonight. Would you pray for me? I'm a Christian, but I'm not living as I ought. God's spoken to my heart. I'm not ready to meet the Lord. Slip up your hand, please, right now. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Yes, God bless you all over. God bless you. Pray for me. I'm saved. I'm not living as I ought. God's spoken to my heart. Others, just slip it up high. All right, one more thing. God bless you, and God bless you. One more thing. 
Is there somebody in here tonight who would say, Brother Comfort, in view of the soon coming of Christ, tonight I'm surrendering my life for full-time Christian service. Tonight, on March the 21st, 2017, I'm surrendering my life for full-time Christian service. If you would say that kindly, slip up your hand, please, right now. Tonight, I am surrendering my life for full-time Christian service anywhere in the building. Father, what a blessed hope. As we look around us, we realize that things are getting worse and worse. And we remember reading in the book that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And yet, dear God, we're not pessimistic. We're optimistic. We know the darker the outlook, the brighter the uplook. And in our minds, it's almost as though we can see the Son of God standing at the exit of heaven. The trumpeters wetting their lips and the curtain on the age of grace about to be lowered. Oh God, this ought to be a motivation for us to serve you with our life. We meet some of our graduates around the United States today that are just making money. And all they're going to have when they stand before the Lord Jesus are a lot of pay stubs to lay at his feet. Oh, dear God, I pray that not one of our students presently will have that mentality. Help them to realize that there is a place in God's service where they can serve him. I thank you, Lord, for the blessed hope. I pray for many who have said, I'm not ready to meet the Lord Jesus. I'd be ashamed were he to come tonight. I pray, dear God, that things will be made right in this invitation. In Jesus' name, let's